Chinese President Xi Jinping attended a major conference to commemorate Karl Marx. During the past 200 years, Karl Marx and his theories, namely the Manifesto of the Communist Party and Das Kapital, have shaped the world history. Communist revolutions, competition among communists and capitalists in the Cold War, have reflected the evolution of Marxism and its relevant theories and practices. With the successful transformation of Chinese Marxism and socialist practices, Marxism has developed a new approach. What do Karl Marx and his communism theory mean for the world in the 21st century? Why does Marxism enjoy a particular significance in developing Chinese socialism? And how do we identify the difference between Marxists elsewhere and the theory and practice of Chinese Marxism? To discuss these issues and more, I'm very happy to be joined here by Professor Zhang Xudong of Comparative Literature at New York University. That's our topic. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. But before we get started, let's take a quick look at this. Two centuries on, society has witnessed the dramatic changes. What's the name of Karl Marx is remembered and respected all over the world, and his theories, known as Marxism, maintain the bright light of truth. These were the remarks of Chinese President Xi Jinping at the commemorative event to mark the 200th anniversary of Karl Marx's birth. Nowadays, we're facing a heavy mission in stabilizing reform and boosting development, and there are many risks and challenges to governance. These are all unprecedented. We must take the advantage and be proactive to win the future. We should use scientific theories of Marxism to analyze and solve the recent issues we're facing, and take it as guidance to make us strong enough to face difficulties and tackle challenges. President Xi Jinping reviewed the legendary life of the great revolutionist and philosopher, speaking highly of his remarkable efforts to contribute to society. Marx spent his life in exile. His family lived in poverty and illness, but the hardship of personal life did not alter his purpose and ideas. He kept fighting until the end of his great life. President Xi Jinping said Karl Marx's life was defined by his noble ideals and his unremitting struggle for human liberation. He said Marx went all the way in the pursuit of truth without fear of hardship or obstacles. He fought to the very last to overthrow the old world and build a new one. Welcome to our discussion here, Professor Zhang. Good to be here, Ray. The Cold War came to an end. Do you think that the whole world, particularly Western countries, must have been surprised by the keynote presentation that President Xi Jinping delivered um, Friday morning in Beijing to commemorate the 200th anniversary of Karl Marx? Well, it's not surprising to me at all. I think it's just uh, uh, about time for the uh, leader of China to indicate a kind of a collective uh, self-awareness that China is on the forefront of a world historical experiment. I think the timing is just right. It's, I think uh, looking back to search uh, for its roots and to un re-understand its origin, its ideological, political, historical origin, is all about how to face the challenges ahead. Then what is the dream of Karl Marx? I think Marx uh, embodies a truly titanic battle uh, between um, human beings and the, the world of, of the creation. Uh, and it's the, like the old saying or the famous uh, phrase by Charles Dickens, it's the best of all times, it's the worst of all times. The capitalism, by, uh, as it, it's understood by Karl Marx, is the single most productive, creative uh, system of human history ever. But at the same time, its uh, reification, its structural, systematic contradictions uh, also constitute a, a kind of human bondage. How to go beyond that, but by means and through its internal contradictions, not by some kind of fantasy or, or abstract idealism, is, is Marx's question. 200 years on, Xu Dong, don't you think Karl Marx and his comrades were only aware of all the 
disadvantages concerning the curse of industrialization in its earliest stage in the United Kingdom and they are not aware they were not aware at all of the benefits of uh, modernization that has been facilitated first by industrialization I think Marx had a, a, a very deep uh, grasp of the uh, benefits material technological intellectual even social uh, uh, brought about by the capitalist development that's not the issue the issue is that uh, the capitalist societies especially in uh, Western Europe and North America uh, unfolded uh, uh, along with uh, both the capitalist economic development and the social political resistance to the onslaught of this uh, system. Uh, capitalist systems including its economic and political dimensions as we understand it today is the result of uh, both what Marx called capitalism as such and uh, the various social experiments, uh, labor movement, you know, student movement, counterculture, uh, including the, the international communism. It's the uh, result of this uh, gigantic uh, struggle in the past centuries. But don't you think communism is uh, utopianism? Well, it certainly has an utopian dimension, uh -huh. uh, but utopia in this particular context should be understood as something uh, based on a critical uh, assessment of reality, based on a concrete analysis of, again, the structural contradictions of capitalism. It's not a fantasy. It's not a pipe dream. Uh, utopia obviously means nowhere, but in this particular context, it means a uh, a critical uh, absorption and a transcendence of capitalist conditions of possibility. In the wake of the Cold War, when we look at what happens every day, we see from the front page stories always conflicts about ethnicity, religious hate, extremism, terrorism, instead of class struggles, and yet this is a catchphrase, class struggle has been used by Karl Marx and uh, Friedrich angles to characterize um, social and economic development ever since we had such a, an idea of a society. I think the, uh, maybe there should be two parts in addressing this uh, question. One is that hi Marxism historically uh, defined does have a some kind of a shortage in uh, insufficiency in addressing issues of nationalism, ethnicity, uh, uh, unequal development in in those uh, uh, lines. Uh, uh, that has been uh, uh, supplanted by various contemporary theories uh, broadly defined as left, uh, leftist thinking precisely in this area. But then uh, um, historical Marxist thinking uh, while uh, emphasizes on class struggle I think in philosophical terms it means the competition uh, between two uh, uh, different modes of production. It's not class narrowly defined, but rather classes as they are uh, uh, defined and, uh, and uh, sort of a, uh, uh, qualified by their respective places within the capitalist mode of production. For instance, the owners of means of production, the owners of power state power, political capital, cultural capital, and so on and so forth, and those who basically are, uh, are reduced to selling their labor power, including intellectual labor power, uh, on the other side of the curtain. So this is kind of a, a more theoretical or historical definition of class. I don't think class should be understood in today's uh, environment in its most narrow sense. Karl Marx uh, said in many of his articles and books uh, um, a lot about the residual value, uh, absolute re residual value and uh, relative residual value. It seems uh, that uh, capitalists or entrepreneurs, uh, employers, whatever you call them, uh, were only keen on exploiting the proletarian people unconditionally. And that has contributed to revolutions ever since the early stage of industrialization. Today, with the rise of the trade unions, 
the powerful role of the uh, labor unions, uh, opposition parties in the parliament or Congress to supervise the ruling, and uh, we have the media whose role is to supervise the um, conduct of the government and the capitalists, of course. We have all these novel things that it seems that Karl Marx failed to foresee in his age. Then, what do you think of the major contradictions that may le lead to further social or political unrest that has been somehow exploited and used by Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin in Russia to uh, set up the Soviet Republic? It's not only Marx who failed to foresee uh, these uh, developments. Even the most uh, uh, unapologetic uh, uh, capitalists uh, in Marx's time could not possibly have foreseen the developments we take for granted today. I think the, the thing is, uh, 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 if we leave capital or capitalist modes of production to its own device, of course, greed and pursuit of profit, those kind of things, uh, are part of its instinct. It's a structural, systematic instinct. It's not, regardless of individual entrepreneurs or you know, uh, businessmen and so on and so forth. Of course, these are all regulated by the state, uh, checked by media, by, uh, critiqued by intellectuals, you name it. But we're looking at the uh, uh, sort of the, 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 the market forces as supposed to a more socialized, more rational understanding of what it is to be human, what a, a better social system could have been, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, um, the Marxist uh, theory addresses uh, these, again, structural uh, issues. Capital is not to be uh, uh, personalized. Uh, it's a a structure. It's almost invisible. That's why Das Kapital is so complicated. It, 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 it offers uh, an unrivaled, even today, analysis of this abstract and yet concrete totality. But, but let me, let me uh, address the second part. I think you referred to the Soviet Union and mm -hmm. Leninism. I, mean, I think your question uh, points to uh, this historical phenomenon namely uh, in Rus Russia and in China in those backward societies, uh, uh, the communist experiment took root, whereas as Marx himself had env envisioned, uh, it should be Western Europe and North America where capitalism, uh, capitalist development was most uh, sophi so sophisticated, right? That would be the place, ideal places for uh, socialism to, to emerge. I think that raises a key question. Uh, a lot of people don't seem to uh, be able to understand it, but I think the issue is rather simple. Mao famously uh, uh, wrote in uh, one of his critiques of uh, Soviet uh, economic textbooks in which he says, without a strong political state, capitalism would never have been able to develop in backward societies like Russia and especially in China because what these places faced was colonial system, the imperial system, the backwardness. So you do need a political intervention led by the vanguard party to seize power in order to create the kind of necessary conditions of possibility for capitalism to develop in yes, those indeed, societies. The debates have been raging now for centuries, no, for decades. Yes, indeed, the debates have been raging for decades as to the myth why revolutions first broke out in Russia and China, the two alleged backward society. You are watching dialogue with the Professor Zhang Xudou from NYU. He's also an expert of Marxist studies. So we are reviewing how the Chinese and the rest of the world look at the legacy of Marxism 200 years on. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Come back, you don't. Ideas and concepts do matter. So does the image. Now, in about 10 days, my colleagues and I will be traveling to the hometown of Karl Marx to do a special program called The Dialogue with the World. It's a brand new program with our German counterparts to commemorate Karl Marx's legacy. Now, 
my colleagues and I have been working very hard and we've been wrestling with the idea of, uh, about how to look at the Karl Marx. Is he just a scholar, a politician, or a spiritual leader for the proletarian uh, communist movement that first changed in Russia and then China and then half of the world if you look at the realities, brutal realities in the Cold War. Of course, uh, today great changes have taken place since the, the Soviet demise. Now, what do you think of uh, a clear definition that is uh, most acceptable for particularly Chinese here when we look at the legacy of Marxism and how to look at Karl Marx himself in the first place. Yeah. He was certainly not a politician. He was an intellectual, a philosopher, a historian, you name it. But he was also the, uh, the inspiration for the various social political uh, movements uh, that ensued. Uh, I think uh, uh, Marx uh, and I think Primarily, now he stands as a text, as a theory, as a discourse, not really a, a person, although the personal dimensions are also, uh, are also very important. I think what he, uh, Marxism, or uh, Marx himself has to offer to China uh, in particular, is this idea of the combination of theory and a practice. Uh, if you listen to uh, President Xi's uh, uh, speech last Friday, uh, you notice this uh, repetitive emphasis on practice and on a theory uh, as two integral parts of a whole. And this is probably the best theoretical definition of the ongoing Chinese experiment. Of course, Marx's theory is, it, is, is, is a foundational idea, but what matters in reality is the Chinese practice guided by theory, and a theory to be uh, challenged, to be modified, uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be expanded by, by this practice. There's no doubt that you know about the strength of logic implied deeply in all of the works by Karl Marx and his comrades. And there's no doubt about the vision of a President Xi Jinping uh, who is proud of uh, uh, inheriting the legacy of Marxism or the Marxist studies in the unique circumstances of China. Now, the point is whether the younger generation can share easily the vision of their fathers and grandfathers. Yeah, <clears throat> I think, uh, again, going back to Xi's speech, I think he plays the role as the mediation, the communicator, the bridge between the older generations and the younger generations. I say this because I think the older generations, the, 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 the founding fathers of the PRC, uh, were primarily driven by a desire to uh, salvage China from the, uh, the humiliation, the oppression of imperialism, colonialism. And uh, by extension, this pursuit of happiness, human freedom, emancipation, you name it. So it's driven more negatively by uh, the uh, uh, miserable conditions uh, in which China found herself uh, in the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century. But the younger generation, I'm, I remain uh, res guardedly optimistic about their um, eventual re-encounter with Marxism, not in the sort of narrow uh, 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 narrow ideological sense, but in the broad context of a fully developed uh, industrial technological society, information society, enhanced human freedom, productivity, cosmopolitan experiences, all this are happening in China right in front of eyes. And the Chinese youth today are being exposed to the world and uh, to China's newfound position place in this world. And this, is, I think, is a very good uh, environment in which uh, they will find Marxism's renewed uh, relevance. For instance, the, the rivalry, the coexistence, the competition, and uh, the interdependence between the Chinese system and the world capitalist system. I mean, through these concrete issues, I think the youth uh, will uh, eventually come to appreciate Marx's uh, intervention uh, made uh, uh, more than a century and a half ago. In many ways, the realities and theories uh, of the 19th century and the 20th century are so different from what we stand for today. What do you think of the application of a Karl Marx and his theory in the present-day China when we undergo uh, 
the transformation, social and economic alike, from central planning to market-oriented economy? Well, I think it remains highly relevant, uh, even central, because we just mentioned the, the sort of revolution nature of the Chinese state. It's a party state. Uh, it's a political state led by a vanguard political organization, namely the CCP. But uh, if you notice, I think the, the recent definition or redefinition or clarification of this revolutionary nature of the Chinese state has shifted from the area of so-called infrastructure, namely ideology, politics, you know, to production, to this continued transformation in the f area of so-called the force of production, namely uh, industry, technology, science. I think the, the Chinese state uh, is becoming increasingly self-aware, self-conscious of its mission as a leader, uh, as an organizer uh, of uh, this permanent, permanent revolution in production, including science and technology. And it's through its transformation in the realm of forces production that it will in enable itself to uh, turn around to continue to work on the, uh, the, the realm, the sphere of infrastructure, namely uh, governance, uh, legal system. Uh, these, what goes without saying, what, what's implicit in this, maybe it's just my personal understanding, is that the so-called infrastructure, the state institutions and the cultural institutions are themselves plastic, namely they are to be molded and remolded, they are going to change along with time. Even CCP, even Marxism or Chinese Marxism will keep changing uh, along with the social environment that has been changed by the real pr practitioners of Marxism. I, th I think this is a very radical idea, but it happens to to be going back to the origin of uh, classical Marxism. You know, the whole world marvel at the miracle that China has achieved over the past four decades since this year marks the 40th anniversary of the opening up and the reform, that China has been able to lift up to 800 million out of poverty. Some, of, some would put it at 700 million, but whatever the, 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 the number, it's a huge, huge uh, contribution to the mandate and mission of the United Nations. Now, having said this, others are also very disappointed with the uneven development in China. For example, we still have the hukou system, the household registration system, and the income disparity, as well as the big differences between the privileged few and um, a majority, silent majority, who, whose income is put to shame by the handful of uh, super rich guys. Now, a lot of uneven things, unfair things uh, happen in China, quite against the theory of what Karl Marx stands for in those days. What do you think of the embarrassment? Well, I wouldn't call it an embarrassment. It's a part of this transma transformation of Chinese social conditions. It, uh, historically uh, speaking, China went through uh, this process of, uh, uh, you know, this change from an ag agricultural society, an agrarian society, to an industrial uh, society. So the, the lifting of the people, millions and millions of people out of poverty is certainly in the direction of, uh, of, 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 of socialism, because even though they are, uh, you can call them uh, consumers or, or uh, urban dwellers, but, but in terms of uh, product, human productivity, capital, you know, realization, freedom, these are, generally speaking, extremely uh, positive. Uh, but the things like the people's commune, uh, the public ownership of the means of production, as well as egalitarianism, which by definition is so close to what the proletarians stood for in the 19th century and even during the Soviet era, I mean, these things have been cast aside with the start of China's reform and the modernization campaign how do you look at such discrepancies? Yeah, there are people who are full of nostalgia when it comes to these issues, but I'm not. Emotionally, maybe I'm still vaguely attached to that uh, pa uh, past era, but rationally, I think it's just a, uh, 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 a, a uh, this 
development uh, in the past decades should be uh, uh, should be uh, congratulated should be viewed rather uh, positively because overall the Chinese labor force's productivity and therefore its social freedom uh, has been enhanced uh, as long as the Chinese state again uh, this political state manages to hold on to this concept of collective or state uh, of national ownership, collective ownership, as, as long as it's, it remains true to this uh, collective ownership as a as a political ideal, I think the rest should be uh, uh, should be taken care of by uh, this uh, historically necessary stage of uh, of, uh, of of uh, of development of social productivity. The last question, uh, Professor Dang, is very mm. much about uh, what actually represents the real soft power of China: Confucianism or Marxism, communism or traditional Chinese studies, uh, Chinese culture. On the one hand, we have set up so many Confucius schools uh, uh, pushing Chinese culture overseas. On the other hand. Such a big rally was organized uh, on Friday in Beijing to commemorate the 200th anniversary, hammering home the message, we are the communist party, the strongest uh, and the most dynamic economy and its leadership today in the present day world. So the, the West must have developed a strong mixed feeling as to <laughs> what are you talking about, yes. Co Confucianism or communism? So what do you think? Well, I think even for an average Chinese, uh, they may feel a little skin of schizophrenic about this sort of split, this division, this dualism, if you, if you like. I, I, I personally, I don't think Confucianism or uh, Chinese tradition, generally speaking, uh, is, uh, uh, is to be essentialized. Uh, I think China is first and foremost a modern state, uh, and in that sense, it's Marxist sort of a principle as a, gui as, as a guiding principle is just a distinct feature of its modernity whereas tradition only con tri contributes to the, uh, the uh, uh, plausibility of the social system of the state's claim on this uh, uh, and its ability to protect this social experiment as opposed to a much smaller country, uh, a much shorter cultural uh, tradition, uh, I think China is in a better uh, position to engage in this large scale world historical, historical experiment. It's just, I think it's the same thing as China happens to have this comprehensive industrial technological basis, this national market which happens to be the biggest in the world in order to sustain this intellectual political uh, experiment. I don't think there's anything, anything particularly cultural or Chinese about Chinese tradition. Joseph Nye, author of A Mega Trend, mm -hmm. said what happens in China since 1979 is a vertical democracy. Perhaps uh, this landmark conference that President Xi Jinping attended and where he delivered the keynote presentation about, Ma about Karl Marx is the beginning of a consensus building which is an important part of China's so modernization drive. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.